Hello, School Transportation Nation. Tony Corpin here. We want to welcome you to the podcast. It's brought to you by TransFinder, the leader in school bus routing software, by IC Bus, and Student Transportation of America. Also, I'll be talking with John Ferguson, Director of Transportation at Klein ISD in Texas, the top transportation team's award winner from last year from STN Expo. TransFinder puts together this great event uh, at STN Expo to nominate. They put out a call for nominations to uh, identify a top transportation team. So this was their inaugural year last year. So we're going again with them. They're uh, opening their nomination nominations to get out there and try to get people engaged. So uh, definitely keep an eye out for that. It was toptransportationteams.com. Uh, but John is going to talk about a little more about what it meant to be a top transportation team and kind of what that what that impact meant when they won that award and how it, that culture in his school transportation operation was impacted by such an award. So uh, it'd be a really interesting conversation for everybody out there because we're asking you this year to nominate a lot of people if it's a garage star or a green bus summit fleet award or a top transportation teams. We have many awards we give and recognition is a very powerful thing within an organization. So guys definitely appreciate you for taking the time to nominate a little later. Miss Taylor Ekbatani and I are going to be talking about the top headlines and she has a great interview as well with Brett Brooks, senior consultant from gray Ram tactical and a frequent presenter at the SCN expo. He'll be at uh, SCN expo. I know in Reno for, for sure. Right, Taylor? Yep. He's excited. He'll give us a little flavor into what that presentation will look like a little later. Yeah. Security and school sites and around the school bus is definitely a big one. I know uh, with uh, Combine, it was the anniversary, right, Taylor? Is that, That's coming up? When is the actual anniversary? Yeah, it's coming up the 25th anniversary here on April 20th. So kind of talking to him about that, about Columbine, and he wrote a blog. So we'll, we'll have that up at stnonline.com. Kind of looking at, you know, what we've done right in 25 years and where we probably still need to improve on the safety and security aspect. So very interesting conversation. Yeah, obviously Uvalde um, over a year ago now it was kind of a top topic when that had happened and uh, the shooting there. And I know school bus security, we have many stories on the stnonline.com website of people forcing their way on school buses or weapons on school buses, um, you know, definitely keeping a close eye on violence and shootings and, and how can school transportation combat that or at least let the driver be that first time touch point and last touch point of that student's day. Cause you know, we definitely see that as a regular conversation in terms of training, keeping the drivers very vigilant. Uh, you know, if there's a change in student behavior and all those are big factors, I think whenever we're transporting it, and it's such kind of an ancillary thing, Taylor, you know, the function of obviously getting kids to and from is the main driver, but there's so many other things environmentally happening on the school bus. And, and it's definitely important to, uh, be aware of changes and, and behavioral changes that might affect the student or the students on the bus. Mm -hmm. And it's definitely something I'm looking at for the May issue of STN, you know, talking to different transportation directors about student behavior. And a lot of directors are saying they're seeing an increase in student behavior and they're attributing it to the pandemic. You know, all these kids were sent home for a year ish and now they're being forced back into socialization. And so they're seeing an increase and especially we've seen just, you know, in the local news articles, an increase in students actually attacking drivers. So my article is kind of looking at how do drivers protect themselves? You know, obviously you don't want to like cause harm to the student, but protect themselves in a way that they're not getting injured themselves. So I'm, it's going to be an interesting article. So you guys stay tuned for, for May. Wonderful. All right. Taylor as the editorial kind of dynamo that she is. She's got a bunch of stories she's prepared and headlines. Before we get to that, we've got a quick message. Today's tech tip is brought to you by IC Bus. Looking for ways to improve your on-time performance and reduced operating costs? 
all IC bus CE series school buses come standard with a factory installed telematics device, including a five year connectivity subscription. You'll gain access to on command connection, an industry leading remote diagnostic solution, providing data that is visible, easy to understand and actionable with OCC. Your school district will have visibility to vehicle health and performance data at your fingertips, including EV specific information like state of charge and estimated range. Learn about other standard capabilities of their connected vehicles at icbus.com. That's icbus.com. All right, Taylor, I know you put up a new story on the stnonline.com website, the growing trend of the four-day school week. I, you know, I don't know what that's like for my kids because we've been in a five-day school week. When I went to school, it was a five-day school week. But I was surprised in reading your article, there are a lot of districts, Colorado kind of being a first mover in this four-day school week and kind of what's the impact to students' the learning time How does that impact transportation, school bus drivers, school bus driver pay? Um, So yeah, lots to unpack there. You want to kind of take a deeper dive on that for us? Yeah. And I think from a parent perspective too, it's important to note that many of these school districts are still offering childcare on that day that they're not, you know, technically in school. So there are a couple staff members who are still at the school and are still offering that childcare, at least from the couple districts that I've spoken with. So that kind of alleviates some pressures off the parent. But in terms of moving to a four day school week, it's kind of as a way to save money, recruit new teachers is kind of what I've been seeing. I'm curious if that will translate to recruiting school bus drivers as well. I talked to independent school district in Missouri, and they started it going a four-day school week this school year. So the transportation director, Daryl Huddleston, he was talking to me. And while it's still too early to say whether or not he's getting more school bus drivers in because of the four-day school week, he certainly sees more drivers this year than he did last year. So a positive there, he said his drivers are really liking the four-day schedule. They are salaried. So they're on a 12 month contract and their hourly pay was actually increased. So they're getting a little more money than they were getting before. So that's great. You know, working four days instead of five and you're actually seeing an increase in pay. I'm sure drivers aren't going to complain about that. But just really interesting on that day that is off, technically um, not a school day, there's options for drivers to pick up more shifts for either athletic events or if there's other school programs that are happening. So he's said it's been a positive shift overall. I think for me, Taylor, it also becomes kind of like, how does this impact the school bus driver shortage or staffing shortages? Um, Also, I can assume if you're going to a four day week, that's also going to reduce the mileage, the wear and tear on your fleet. Now it seems small, but cutting one day a year is one thing, but to cut, you know, one day a week for how many weeks are in the school year. I I guess I don't even know how many days are in the school year. It's all blurs together when your kids are in school, but what's that look like Taylor? Do we have a sense of what kind of cost savings the fleet is seeing? Did did Daryl share that with you? I think it's still, it was still too soon because it hadn't been a full year yet. So I'm curious to check back with him at the end of the school year and maybe we can like get him on the podcast or something to have him talk about it. But in terms of instructional days, you mentioned they went from 170 to 155 school days of actually transporting students. Yeah, that's uh, that's definitely an interesting thing, because now you're really looking at reduction of tire use, brake use, fuel use. I mean, that kind of has a cumulative effect potentially to save the transportation department money. Now, I guess the fear, like you talked about, was do my drivers 
lose money because they're on a, you know, now in this case, I think it was a salaried situation where the drivers are salaried employees, but they're getting higher utilization on the fifth day as like a bonus day for taking kids on activities. So they're, they're not only making more money per hour, now they're making additional money for this, I guess it's a way of giving your drivers a raise kind of indirectly kind of offering them an OT or a, um, an additional uh, opportunity to do all these other extracurricular activities or, or uh, extended care programs that schools are offering. So this is a very interesting dynamic um, and clearly a trend we're seeing uh, on many levels. And, and from what it sounded like, ISD really kind of did their due diligence uh, within that, that conversation, talking to other school districts and really getting a sense like, what were your guys' benefits? Because, right, you're really weighing what's the cost-benefit analysis when you make that decision. And clearly, that's not coming from transportation. Transportation is just following through on what the the superintendent and probably the school board. And I assume moving to a four-day school week probably requires a vote from the school board and they probably get comment from parents, which I could see the downside from a parent. If you are a working parent, what do you do on that fifth day when your child is not in school? And what if your school doesn't offer those programs? What do you do? So I could see pushback from parents in terms of that, but yeah, that, that you know, it's, it, it's an interesting trend. We'll have to keep an eye on. Yeah, and I think ISD definitely did their due diligence. And and just to reiterate, you know, it says this in the article, but I just want to mention it here on the podcast, that even though they went down one day, they're not losing instructional time. So that's a huge piece. I know, especially with, you know, students with special needs, you know, they need to be in school and they need to get a certain hours. All students are required that. It differs by state. So Missouri requires 522 hours for each school year for kindergartners and 1,044 hours for grades 1 through 12. And the way they compensated for that school day is by increasing Tuesday through Friday by 35 minutes. So, and that's something that we've kind of seen to in Sanger ISD in Texas, they also increased its school day by 35 minutes, even though they reduced one day a week of school. So that's kind of how they compensate to make sure students are still getting the instructional time that they need. Well, okay. So if you're going from 170 to 155, I guess that's actually 15 school days, but still it becomes an impactful situation when you kind of recover those 15 days. Cause right. That's over two weeks of actual drive time. Um, yeah. I mean, when you really start to extrapolate out the savings over time, it's pretty significant. So i um, quite curious maybe on some of those results. We'll have to follow up nation. Are you guys going to a four, four day school week? We'd love to hear from you. Um, you can email Taylor. I'm sure she'd love to add that into her story. Uh, Taylor, want to hit him with your email? Yeah. Feel free to email Taylor T A Y L O R at S T N online.com. And I, yeah, I would love to hear from you. Beautiful. All right, Taylor, what other kind of top headlines we got going this week? Yeah, so the NTSB released its preliminary report on the Illinois school bus crash. And I know that last couple of weeks, you guys have been talking about the Texas crash. And to my knowledge, at this time, the NTSB hasn't said they're investigating that one, but they have reported, put out a preliminary report on the Illinois crash. And this happened on March 11th. This was in Rushville, Illinois. And it's the crash resulted in the death of three preschool students and the school bus driver, as well as the driver in the other vehicle. The report is pretty bare bones, I would say. Nothing too earth shattering. There's no exact details on the cause of the crash. You know, I know the school bus driver drifted into the other lane and we've kind of talked about some reasonings of why that could be, but still no report on exactly what caused it. They did say about halfway through navigating a right-hand turn is when the school bus crossed into the other lane uh, and hit that combination vehicle, as the NTSB is calling it. It's a truck tractor with a 
semi trailer connected to it is kind of what I'm understanding. And then that vehicle was hauling sand. So not exactly sure what caused the school bus to go into the other lane, um, but did say that it happened when the school bus was going around a right hand curve. So curious to see, you know, what the final reports will be. Uh, it is expected next year that they will release this, but the preliminary report is out and there's an article uh, up on it on our website. Yeah, I know when I when I took a look at the article, uh, they had identified the actual make and model of the bus. It was a 2020 Microbird uh, 25 passenger Type A school bus. So just to clarify for the audience, it wasn't a Type C or Type D; it was a Type A. Um, so definitely on a on a probably a GM chassis or Ford chassis. It doesn't specify, but um, and and obviously this happened midday, right around 11:29 a.m. Um, and the report had stated the weather was clear. It was dry. There wasn't any weather. So one could surmise this was probably a medical uh, emergency or something happened to the driver and that caused this uh, driver to veer into the oncoming traffic of the, of the semi truck. And, you know, obviously a very unavoidable collision and tragic. And the fact that the children, uh, two of them were siblings, it's just unimaginable the grief that a parent is going to be feeling in this situation. And, you know, our hearts really go out to them thinking about them and, you know, someone with small children like myself, it's just like, you know, that is just unbearable to think losing both your children, uh, you know, in the same incident. It's just tr so tragic, Taylor. Yeah, it's, it's really sad. And I know, you know, the industry has been seeing, you know, two of these high profile crashes. And so, like you said, our hearts just kind of go out to everyone involved in these tragedies. All right, Taylor, uh, shifting gears a little bit. I know uh, you had sent out some stuff. You're nominating Garage Stars. Guys, do you know a outstanding professional in your school transportation operation that is in your garage, mechanic, technician, inspector? Uh, we got a lot of those unsung heroes that are helping keeping our fleets going. Uh, have you nominated them? Taylor, you know, we get lots of great nominations for, for different fleet professionals. This is a great way to recognize people and that are the really kind of these unsung heroes uh, keeping our buses going and safe. Yeah, nominations are still being accepted until May 1st. So if you haven't nominated anyone, please do. Um, we go through all the responses. We choose the top 10, and then they are profiled in our August edition of the magazine. Also, something that we've started doing, which is really special, is if you are selected as a top 10, you'll actually be given complimentary registration to one of the next year's shows. So we're in 2024 now. So 2025 shows. So we have a lot of, you know, inspection, maintenance classes at the expos. So really a great way to honor your maintenance professionals and, and give back to all the hard work that they're doing. To nominate a Garage Star, you can go to stnonline.com slash go slash GS, as in Garage Star. So, uh, Definitely check it out. Check out the link and nominate someone. Yeah, I know there's a story on the stnonline.com website. So if that link is too complicated, just go to stnonline.com, find our story on Garage Stars, and there's a nomination form right within that story. So I uh, really encourage everybody, uh, if you have garage professionals, and I'm sure you all do, if you have a school bus, <laughs> and you're running school buses, you definitely got garage professionals. So uh, definitely get out there, recognize them, appreciate them, love on them. So thanks, guys, for uh, taking the time to go do that. Uh, we also have our green bus summit fleet award so at the stn expo we honor six different groups that are innovating in the area of green energy so if you are maybe planning on going to stn expo this summer specifically uh, in reno nevada those awards are really a great way to recognize uh, your own school district so don't be afraid to self-nominate uh, you go to the stn expo.com slash west website and uh if you go under the uh the event you'll find green bus summit fleet awards under the event tab you click on that there's a nomination form right there so if you're investing in electric cng propane renewable diesel biodiesel um, we want to hear what you're doing within your operation that you're doing to kind of reduce nox pollution uh make a 
positive environmental impact, help out your community, uh, improve student health and well-being, and just say, you know, what that future outlook is uh, at your school district and also for school bus contractors as well. And we, we break it out by fleet size. So we've got different categories. So if you're a small fleet versus a large fleet, uh, you know, you're, you drop into different categories, small, medium, large, rural, and then private fleet contractor, uh, regional, and then we have national. So a good mix of districts and private fleet contractors are represented. So uh, we highly recommend that you uh, recognize your school district or contractor for one of these awards. All right, Taylor, we are going to get to some interviews here in just a second. Before we do that, we've got a quick message. This message is brought to you by Student Transportation of America, a leader in school transportation services. STA operates more than 22,000 vehicles throughout the U.S. and Canada, delivering safe and reliable transportation and fleet services to school districts of all sizes. STA is committed to moving the industry toward a greener future and positively impacting the health of passengers and the planet through their use of electric vehicles, alternative fuels, and other green fleet initiatives. To learn how STA may be able to help your district, visit RideSTA.com. That's RideSTA.com. All right, School Transportation Nation, we got a special guest with us, John Ferguson, Director of Transportation at Klein ISD down in beautiful Texas. How are we doing, John? I'm doing great. I'm glad to be here again. Excellent. So we saw each other on stage at STN Expo. You uh, you got one of the top transportation teams awards. TransFinder had put together this great program, challenging everyone to uh, ask their staff, "Are we doing a good job?" And it's you know it's scary and exciting at the same time. What you're going to get back, right? That's right. It is. So, uh, you know, for us, uh, the, the scary part is, uh, you know, uh, can we do it again? Is Are we going to be successful? Do we keep doing what, we, what we've done all year long? Is Are the, all those things that we did to be a success going to continue to be a success? And then, uh, but, but the exciting part is, you know, it, it keeps you on your toes and we want to keep uh, working towards uh, a common goal so we can be the best, you know, top transportation team again. Well, you know, talk to me a little bit about what that award meant to you, as well as what it meant to your staff and kind of, did you see a a shift in mindset when you were actually recognized by the industry as one of the absolute top transportation teams in the entire country? Yeah. So, you know, for us, first off, it was truly an honor. I mean, to be able to say that you know, you know, be a nation a nationwide award, really, you know, is, is top transportation team in North America. When you think about that, when you think about North America, you, you know, that's even more than just America. That's the mm. continent. And when you think about that in those terms, uh, uh, you know, it, it was a pretty proud moment for us and for our team. And But I think what it did really for us is it said, okay, well, we're recognized for this award, but what is it that we're not doing? You know, what can we do to up our game? What can we do better? You know, the, the ultimate thing that we want to do is be safe and provide safe transportation for our students and and to make sure that we don't lose kids and make sure that we're routed correctly and make sure that we're in the right place at the right time and make sure that, you know, we're kind and polite when, when parents call and they need us because, uh, you know, their children are, you know, it's everything to these, to our, to our parents and, and the cargo that we, uh, that we transport is, is unlike any other cargo any other transportation industry when you think about it. I mean, we're, we're transporting children. And I, and I think after winning the award, you know, it, it made us uh, reflect on what that really means and 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 try to prepare and, and be better and look for holes in, in what we're doing and how can we uh, improve and just get better. That's, that's kind of where we're at. Can you tell me a little bit, unpack a little bit how how you led to this award, right? So walk through the process when you received the email, like what made you really apply for this award? Because, right, it was the inaugural year. People were like, what is this? What's the process? How do I go through it? How do I engage my team to fill out these surveys? You know, it feels like a big task. Yeah. So um, when we first applied for the award, you know, our mindset was uh, whether it's the inaugural award or whether it's, uh, you know, it, 
they've been doing it for 20 years. For us, it was, you know, we felt like we were a top transportation team already. Everything that we do and, and how we conduct business and the, and the way that we go about uh, just doing things and the way we analyze and the way that we uh the, the way that we just methodically work through our problems and stuff, it, you know, we feel like we're a top transportation team. And so uh, when we started and, and applying for the award and we, you know, we don't, we don't have any idea how it all works. We fill out an application and then they're like, Oh, what, now we need to send these emails. And now we're going to ask your people. And, and we know, you know, we got 425 employees here and, you know, how are we going to get a large vast majority of them to respond and, and those kinds of things. So we were very, um, uh, we were very proactive about first off when that when the email first came and you know it came to my email address as well and, and when it first came uh, the first thing I did was send out an email and said hey this is not spam you know we wanted to make sure that people knew it wasn't a spam email and and uh, you know that it was an email that we really encouraged and wanted them to uh, uh, to fill out and then I, I just sent out an email and I said hey uh, you know we're applying for a top uh, transportation team but but I want you to be honest in your survey questions, because the only way we can get better to is, is for you to be honest. And so we sent out emails. Uh, we worked on Remind, and uh, we got a Remind app that goes straight to their text messages and just really asking them to make sure that they had um, that they had seen it and that they had filled out the uh, uh, survey. And I'm not sure what the percentage was, but um, it was it was a pretty good percentage based on, I guess, the numbers of people that would normally. I'm sure there's some kind of formula out there that says, you know, that, that you're going to expect a certain amount of responses uh, back based off of the amount of people that you send it. And and so we were pleased. But this year, we, we you know, we're, we're going to try to push it even harder and try to get more people um, to participate in it because it is a big deal. And, and And my whole team felt a sense of pride from it. That's great. Yeah. I mean, I think when you start to get. Uh, and and the responses are blind too, right? You don't know who's saying what, right? So it's so it's anonymous. So it gives people a level of trust to be able to provide honest feedback. I know many of us have like this feedback jar that's like, hey, put your your thoughts in the feedback jar. And a lot of people, you don't get much. Maybe you get complaints, but this is a way to reflect and really say, what are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? Where can we improve? Where are kind of, you know, where are these kind of uncovered opportunities? And it sounds like you really took that data and that feedback and, and you really took it to heart and, and looked in, internally and said, how can we improve? Absolutely. And so, you know, just some of the things like, like um, we got generic responses. As you said, we, we don't get the uh, responses and I don't have a clue who sends them or who, who answers uh you know, the lowest of the scale or the highest part of the scale. But but from a generic question, like, would you recommend, you know, the client ISD transportation department to your friends or colleagues? And so when you look at those and then you look at what your score is and you're like, OK, we're doing pretty good there. But where did we not score very good at? And you start looking at some things where you didn't score very good. And, and those are the things that we really tried to focus on. You know, we really tried to focus on on making this a place that people wanted to, to work at and they wanted to be at because uh, in the Houston area where we're at, there's, you know, there's 20 or 30 uh, different school districts that somebody can go to and the, the money's basically the same. I mean, the, you're not, you're not moving to the district next door to me for, uh, you know, for 15 cents, you know, we're just real similar when it comes to those things. So what do we have to offer that other districts don't have to offer? And uh, for us, it's the morale it's the uh, camaraderie that we have in our department. It's how we treat people. It's how we treat each other. It's how we listen to the problems that people have and the things that they need and, and kind of their wants and their desires. And then we, you know, we take that short list and we say, okay, what can we do? You know, what, what are these things in our, in our budget or not a budget restraint that we can do today? What's that low hanging fruit, you know, that we can do? And so that, that was kind of our approach after winning the award. Yeah, when uh, President CEO Antonio Civitella came to me originally with this idea, you know, that that really, I think what you just described was what he wanted the outcome to be. So, you know, when you're when you're in the kitchen cooking this up, you're like, all right, we got this great idea. We're going to execute it. But to actually see you take the next step, go through the entire process and then really take advantage of that, that benefit is enormous, right? And I think that regardless if you're a TransFinder customer or not, you can 
apply for this award, right? And I think that this, it does this not specific to the brand. It's a way for everyone to look at it. And, you know, Antonio, who's the CEO, you know, of TransFinder was very, very specific that he wanted this to be open to everyone. Everybody needs the opportunity to have this kind of experience to be able to get feedback and honest feedback from your staff and really think, how do we digest this? How do we improve as an industry? And I think that that's, it's very transformational with communities and organizations. Now, when you came back from winning this award, your superintendent, your whole school board, I mean, this is, people got to be hyped up about this, right? They were really pumped. Absolutely. Uh, we, we went in front of the school board and uh, got recognized in front of the school board. And, and it was. It, and, and I think uh, the superintendent, uh, she did a really good job to talk about it being a, an award for North America. And, and uh, just bragging about, you know, we've won state awards and we've even won national awards, uh, but we've never won an award that was uh, that was continent specific, you know. And so uh, she really made a big deal out of that. And and uh, really got it hopped up. Um, our communications team did a really good job um, getting the word out and, and writing articles about it and sending those things out. And and it has been really good for us. Uh, we put it on our signature line. All of my supervisors and office staff, they have it on our signature line. So when you get an email, you know, it's, it says Top Transportation Team 2023. And it's really been cool. And it's really been neat. And, and, and I think, uh, you know, from Antonio's, you know, it's his vision, but uh, you know, we're the prime example. We we are not a transfinder customer. Uh, we have been in the past, and um, and we certainly can see ourselves being a transfinder customer again. It just it, it just so happens that um, that we're not at the moment. But you know, I, I give him a lot of credit. You know, for saying, hey, this this is this is about the industry and not about us, transfinder. And uh, you know, for me, that was that's that's a really neat uh, thing. And and I don't know, there's a lot of vendors out there or, or a lot of partners out there that. Uh, uh, that think that away. And so um, it was really encouraging for us to know that not only did we win the inaugural one, but we have, we have the same opportunity to win again, you know, as anybody else has, regardless of whether we're a customer or not. So it's really been good. Everybody's chasing you, John. They're, they're going to be vying to take your, take your crown away. So you gotta, you gotta get everybody engaged, right? Absolutely. Well, wonderful. Well, guys, highly recommend you apply out there. TopTransportationTeams.com. Go check that out. Uh, great award. It's presented at STN Expo in Reno. They have a luncheon on Monday, July 15th, uh, main stage where all these top transportation teams that are in the finalist stage all come together for a very dynamic session and conversation, as well as the recognition of this great award. So John, thank you for coming on and having great memories about how this is and getting you excited for, uh, for SCN Expo 2024, as well as the top transportation teams award. Absolutely. We're excited and I appreciate y'all having me on and I'll see you guys at Reno. Um, regardless of how the award turns out, me and some of my team will be there. So we're excited. Love to have you. Thanks for being here. All right. Thank you. Hey, thanks to John for uh, chatting with me just a minute ago. We got Taylor coming up with Brett Brooks. All right, guys, I'm back and I have another great guest on the podcast. I'm always introducing great guests. We never have bad guests, but only great ones. Um, today we have Brett Brooks, the senior consultant of Gray Ram Tactical. He's a frequent STN speaker, so hopefully you guys are all familiar with him. But welcome, Brett. I believe this is your second podcast, so thanks for coming back. It is. Thank you very much for having me back. This is my second time with you guys and uh, excited. And obviously no stranger to the industry. You've given great presentations at STN Expo Indy and Reno. Lots of great conversations. Yes. And in fact, I got another one coming up this July out in Reno again to, to give another presentation. So looking forward to that as well. Awesome. Well, we'll tease uh, the audience in a little bit about what they can expect for that one. But for those who are maybe unfamiliar, can you provide a little background on you? You know, I know law enforcement, you're a security expert, and then of course you participate in training. So what interests you in, in this line of work? 
Sure. So, yeah. So with Gray Ram Tactical, uh, we have been around for a little over 17 years, specializing in training uh, schools on safety and security procedures, specifically school bus drivers. Um, what do we do if there's an act of violence on the bus? How do we respond to it? And more importantly, how do we prevent it? Uh, this all kind of stemmed from my time in law enforcement. So I've got a total of a little over 21 years in law enforcement, was responding to an active shooter scene. Um, and when I got there, some of the other police officers from other agencies were not properly properly trained on that response. And so that's where Gray Ram kind of initiated from is was getting law enforcement trained properly to to respond to those types of incidents. Uh, additionally, I have a over 24 years of military experience, uh, a lot of that uh, in, in a variety of different places and doing a variety of different things. So I try to bring in all of that experience um, and background to try to give training presentations ultimately to people that, uh, that can save their lives. Yeah, I know we've had some interesting ones. I think the last one was in Reno and it was teaching uh, about concealed carry and weapons. And you had people go in the back and hide their weapon and the audience had to guess, you know, which one was hiding the weapon. And, it, it, you know, it's hands on. People like that kind of stuff. Yeah, that one was really a lot of fun. It was a large audience, got some people out in the hallway, gave them some training guns and, and knives and different weapons. And everybody had to guess who was the one concealing weapons on stage. It was it was very fun and, and entertaining, but at the same time, very educational. Mm -hmm. And it's hard. I, I mean, I was sitting there too. I was trying to figure out which one it was, but yeah, defi definitely a skill that, you know, student transporters should learn. Sure. So we're approaching here on the 25th anniversary of the Columbine High School shooting that took place in 1999. And I know that's kind of where this podcast stemmed from. And you were kind of telling me that you wrote a blog. So we're going to have that at stnonline.com. So everyone stay tuned for that. But can you kind of give us a little bit of, you know, information on this blog, you know, 25 years later, what are we kind of looking at? Yeah, absolutely. So like I mentioned, uh, Gray Room Tactical is starting kind of in response to a negative response to an active shooter. Um, and when we look back over the last 25 years since Columbine, uh, I sat down, I took a look at how can we learn from those lessons and what have we learned? What have we not learned? Uh, during that shooting, there was 13 uh, victims uh, at the time, the deadliest school shooting uh, in America. Since then, unfortunately, we've had um, a number of more deadly shootings. And so I think at 25, Five year mark, it's really good to look back and, and society look at back at the broad picture and really try to determine have we made progress in making our students safer? Um, have we made schools safer and those types of things? So I just basically uh, started researching um, what have we done in those 25 years and broke it down into 13 headings or 13 subjects, um, basically representing one topic for each of the 13 victims. And just out of curiosity, uh, just a little sidestep, how are deadly school shootings ranked? Like, how is that kind of figured out? Because I was kind of looking and it looks like it, it takes into fatalities and injuries. Correct. There's there's different ways of, of doing it. And sometimes uh, one of the issues uh, to talk about maybe today is, is the political aspect. When we look at strictly deaths, um, how deadly is a shooting, uh, then that maybe ranks it at a certain spot on the list, if you will, where if you look at fatalities and injuries, then that kind of manipulates the numbers. So really, there's two ways of looking at it. The standard is simply deaths, though, how many mm -hmm. people actually died. And if you think about it, just take a step back. In the last 25 years, our school shootings are becoming more deadly, while at the same time, our medical is getting better and better, right? We are more able to save somebody's life today after a shooting as compared to 25 years ago, but yet we're continuing to have higher death tolls. So just an interesting aspect, the technology for medicine is getting better, yet we're still losing more and more people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think recently we had Uvalde, Texas, and I think that one jumped just in terms of death toll and, and deadly shootings. It did. Yeah, that one uh, definitely surpassed uh, the Columbine shooting 25 years ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So looking at Columbine specifically, I know you said you did some research. So looking at lessons learned, what are some takeaways that, you know, we've picked up on now and, and maybe some of some shortfalls? 
Sure, absolutely. And there's definitely some successes. Unfortunately, in the 13 uh, categories, the 13 areas that I looked at, there's significantly more failures, though. So I'll, I'll save the successes for the end. Um, but let's talk about some of the hard not lessons learned, if you will. And the first one of those is is the media coverage. We still broadcast the names and faces of those killers. And when you hear a name of somebody, that's typically the name of the killer. And we really need to move away from that. We really need to, if we're going to show pictures or say names, it needs to be the victims. It needs to be the heroes involved during the shooting um, and stop kind of idolizing the, the, the killers. In fact, uh, after uh, Columbine, Virginia Tech happened and Virginia Tech shooter actually referenced the Columbine shooters in leading up to his attack and used them kind of as a, as a role model and looking at how many people they killed, how they did it and using them by name. Mm-hmm. We still kind of see that today. So that, that's one of the failures is we need to kind of maybe cut back on the, on the media coverage that we give to the killers. And maybe even when looking at media coverage, maybe not just the killers, but the event in general, because as you said, copycat people could be out there using the same ideas. That's absolutely true. And if you think back to just a couple months ago, we had the Super Bowl, one of the most viewed sports events ever, right? And so during the Super Bowl, we had a quote unquote streaker that got down on the field and started running across the field. Well, during the live broadcast, when that happened, the cameras immediately cut away from that individual running across the field. They cut to the commentators and the commentators immediately changed the subject. The NFL did not give any type of video coverage of that individual. They didn't even talk about the individual. So today, even if you want to see that individual, you have to search it out on YouTube to see really what that quote unquote streaker did. So the NFL's kind of learned, hey, if we promote the negative activities, more and more people are going to do it. We as a society as a whole, when it comes to killings and shootings, need to kind of take the NFL's uh, lead on that and, and do the same thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. I, I know they mentioned it briefly and then it's like, OK, that's it. Done. Moving on, you know, with the NFL. Exactly. So. Okay. So what else, you know, can we, can we take away from Columbine? So I think the, another big failure here that I want to address is when we look back at the Columbine shooting 25 years ago, technology obviously was a little bit different. The the killers during that shooting, um, they were playing a video game at the time called Doom. It was uh, at the time a very deadly kind of shoot 'em up kind of video game. In fact, it was so good at teaching people how to kill others that the U.S. Marine Corps actually made it their own version of Doom to train Marines on how to kill people. And so with technology over the last 25 years, our, our video games have become more and more interactive, more and more realistic. In some games, it's, it's hard to determine if it was a, a movie clip or it's an actual computer animated video clip. And so when we look at the exposure to violence in society, whether that's through the video games or exposure through um, violent movies and those types of issues, that's that's a big issue. Um, we know that it was a problem for the Columbine tuners. They were partially influenced through some of that exposure to violence. And today we still have that. In fact, one of the failures, if you look back to 25 years ago versus today, the average 18 year old American today, by the time they turn 18, will have witnessed over 100,000 murders. That includes all the murders that they witness in movies, television programs, playing video games. And all, obviously, that just means you're becoming desensitized to that violence. So the more we're exposed to it, the less we seem to care about it. And as kids are growing up in this environment, they, they unfortunately turn to violence. Wow. That, that's a big statistic number just to wrap your head around, you know, and, and you just watch a movie, you see violence. It, it is, it's natural. It's normal. You don't really think twice about it. Yeah, exactly. And in fact, you know, we put warning labels on um, cigarettes, we put warning labels on alcohol so that kids don't partake in those types of activities that are dangerous. Yet a lot of parents, you know, um, when they see a, a warning label on a video game, they continue to buy that game for the children. Even though there's warning labels on movies, kids uh, still are being exposed to this. And, and in fact, little research for all the listeners, if you research the deadliest movies, as far as the most on-screen deaths, I think everybody would be quite surprised with what number one is with the most on-screen deaths. I'll I'll leave that up to the viewers to Google that. Um, But it's probably a movie that almost every kid in America has seen. Dang, now I feel like I need to look it up really quickly. Just <laughs> I'll save it for after the podcast. Okay, <laughs> so that's that's interesting. That's a good point. Awesome. Yeah, and I think, you know, when we look at successes, there are successes, though. We, You know, I hate to just focus in on all the negativity. You know, if we look at the school response uh, to a shooting, 
that has come a long way. You know, back 25 years ago, kids were taught tornado drills, fire drills. They were never taught how to respond to an intruder or an active shooter within their school. Today, we do that. We have training programs for students on how to respond. We have training programs for faculty and staff on how to respond. And so that is a giant success that we have made strides in the last 25 years to make kids safer within the school. So that 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 definitely those drills those, those that training that they go through has been um, definitely a success for us. Mm-hmm. I think something else that's interesting that you talked about it might have been indie, but I'm not sure um, was looking not just at gun violence, but also you know knives or I think you mentioned even like a bow and arrow. Is that there's other types of weapons that are coming into schools, and I think. Even with Columbine, they had propane tanks, I want to say. Correct. And, and what's interesting there, you kind of hit on two different things, uh, but they're, they're connected. When we think about violence in society, especially in schools, we tend to go immediately, our, our minds go to guns. Uh, and it's not always the case. So in Columbine, for example, they did use propane. They tried to blow up the school, literally blow it up. Luckily, that did not happen. But it would not have been the first time that a school being blown up was actually uh, done. In fact, the deadliest school massacre, uh, I can't say shooting because it was a bombing actually occurred in Bath, Michigan. Um, That had killed that event, which was a bombing, actually killed more students than any shooting that we've had since uh, since then. And that was something that occurred uh, many, many years, many years ago. Um, But when we talk about, you know, other things, knives, bows and arrows, those types of things, I use the example of um, the day of of Sandy Hook, the tragedy during that event where somebody walked in with a gun to an elementary school the exact same day, we had a different school um, where somebody walked in with a knife and was attacking elementary students with a knife. The same week as Sandy Hook, we had another student walk into a school uh, with a bow and arrow and was shooting people with bows and arrows. So we we tend to, in America, we tend to think, well, this is a gun issue. Um, yes, there are issues with guns. There's problems there that need to be solved, but we can't just fixate on the, the firearm aspect of it. Uh, because if you look at violence across the world, we have violence in schools all over the place. Africa right now is seeing more school violence than anywhere else. Uh, Europe has had a traumatic uh, increase in their school violence. And so in, in those some of those areas, it's not always guns. Sometimes it is knives, machetes, bows and arrows, bombs, those types of things. Mm-hmm. And not to get you know too political, but I think maybe that comes back to the media conversation on what is being put out there in the world and what people are consuming. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I like you say, not to get political, but every news station kind of has their angle and um, everybody's in it to, to try to make their own money. I get that. Um, but we have to individually as the consumers of media, we have to take it upon ourselves to get the full story because I don't know that there's any news station out there that's going to give you the full, full picture. Right. They're just going to tell you their angle, of course. Yeah. So another take on, you know, looking at at the school shootings, I was speaking with Greg Jackson. He was the former executive director of transportation for Jeffco Public Schools in Colorado, which Columbine High School is a part of. And he was explaining the community bond over this tragedy. And so something that I found interesting, and I don't know if this is, you know, the same or different than other, other schools, but they chose to keep the name and keep the building exactly the same. I mean, they did a couple of renovations, but I know some schools choose to knock it down and rebuild. Correct. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes um, what we've seen is the the influence of the student body and kind of what they want. Um, 25 years ago after Columbine, the student body really came together and they did not want a new school. Uh, obviously, there's some things that need to be remodeled, some things that need to be done. But no, yeah, they did not tear down the building and start fresh. Other other cases, there's schools where something happens um, and they do. They tear down the building, they build fresh or they transfer over to another location. But I think regardless of where where the event takes place, you're going to have that community bonding. You're going to have memorials and shrines set up to remember those that were uh, unfortunately killed and, and those that were injured. And so I think that's important to have that memorial uh, at that location, whether it's at, at the actual school or if it's a, a leftover site, if you will, if, it, if the school's been moved. Mm-hmm. So it kind of gets into the, the next point of the conversation, you know, is 
is navigating the the visitors or the looky loos. I'm not exactly sure the correct terminology, but the people who are visiting these high schools or these sites, I'm not exactly sure their reasoning, the history, or you know they feel connected or something. But in, in Columbine's case, you know it's still a high school; students are still in session, and so I'm sure when these anniversaries come, you know there's going to be more people visiting these areas. So, what are some you know, safety techniques that that districts can employ there. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, people come for different reasons. They come to remember, they come to protest, they come for whatever their their reasoning is to go there. But for those districts that unfortunately have had one of these tragedies, I think one of the things that we can do on those key anniversary dates is just to take a step back and actually remember it. So, you know, different schools handle it differently. But if you have an anniversary date, sometimes canceling classes that day, um, that removes students from those those onlookers, those visitors that are trying to come in and, and possibly could be a distraction. Uh, instead, just cancel classes that day. Take it as a day to remember uh, the events of the past um, and try to make you know changes for a better future. Yeah, that's a good point. And, you know, we have a presentation this year in Indy by Max Christensen of the Ohio Department of Education. And he's going to talk about the school shooting at Perry High School, where his kids attended at the time. So looking at it from a dad's perspective, what that looks like, getting that phone call, you know, hey, dad, there's there's a shooter at my school. You know, that that's probably a conversation or that no parent would ever want to hear. Absolutely. And I, and I think that's going to be an excellent presentation, you know, given the unfortunate circumstances that he had to live through. I think here in his perspective is going to be important. If we look back at Uvalde, uh, you know, we had the stories of law enforcement officers who had family in the school that rushed in to try to do something. Uh, and it's, it's not just a uh, an American issue. If we look back to one of the worst school attacks ever in Beslan, Russia, they, there we had parents in the entire community coming to the school to try to do something, shut down the roadways, ambulances couldn't respond, police couldn't respond. Ultimately, the military had problems responding simply because of the number of people that were that were trying to get there. And so I think getting that perspective, what's it like if when your kid's actually going through one of these, I think it's going to be a great presentation. Mm-hmm. And then you made up a good point because, you know, you get that phone call from your kid. The first thing you want to do is go to the school. So now schools are not only navigating what's going on inside, but they're navigating what's going on outside. Absolutely. And I think that's the direct kind of segue into pupil transportation is because one of the biggest things we have to in in, the, in thinking about school buses is after one of these events and we're possibly even during it, depending on how long it's taking is student reunification, transportation away from a site. And so that coordination for pupil transportation, how do we move individuals from where the danger area is to a safe place and get them reunited with family? Um, and then, it's, you know, obviously the school has to, to broadcast that out. They have to make sure parents know where to go to, for that reunification as well. Mm-hmm. And something that was interesting with Uvalde was uh, police officers or people there, law enforcement, were putting injured students on school buses and telling the school bus driver, hey, drive you know, to the nearest hospital or whatever. And there's an interview with a school bus driver and she said that she had Band-Aids on her bus. So that was like all her first aid. So obviously you know, school bus drivers shouldn't probably be transporting kids to the hospital, but what can school bus drivers do to better prepare themselves if there is an emergency on the bus or some sort of situation in in which they need to have tools available? Yeah, absolutely. In today's world, we're seeing more and more violence on school buses in the United States. Um, recently put out some some information about some research that we did with our company and, and looking at that increase specifically on school buses and the increase of violence. And so, you know, when we talk about first aid kits, today's first aid kits, not the first aid kit of 25 years ago in 1999. We can't just have Band-Aids and, and you know, stuff for cuts and bruises. We really need those things for gunshot wounds, that mass violence trauma related research response. And then that includes things like, you know, tourniquets, um, hemostatic or like quick clot type of products, uh, chest seals, and those things that actually that military and law enforcement are carrying. It's unfortunate, but those are the types of things we actually need on a school bus for in today's world. And it's not just about the violence aspect of it, too, from a medical perspective. If we look at the crash and haze that just occurred not just but a couple of weeks ago, those same types of life-saving pieces of equipment could be used in a traffic crash. And so having drivers trained on 
the use of those specialized medical tools and actually having those products actually on the bus in their first aid kit is, is going to be important. Mm -hmm. And I want to speak on, you know, violence on the school bus a little bit. I'm working on an article for the May issue of STN that's kind of looking at that. And something that we've seen is more students attacking school bus drivers than probably I've, I've seen, you know, since I started working here. And so as a school bus driver, you know, you're kind of taught, hey, hands off, like don't touch the kids. But if you're being, I mean, these videos, the kids are wailing on these school bus drivers. How can they protect themselves without actually causing harm? Yeah, that's a definitely a good question. And when you look at it, the, you got to kind of take a step back and say, okay, what happened before that event? Before punches were thrown, what happened? And so that's where training comes in and having the drivers trained on things like indicators of violence. Um, when you can determine when somebody's going down the road of aggression and then understanding things like de-escalation, how do we cut them off on that road of aggression to get them calm back down? Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's basically seven things that if, for any human being that's going to trigger aggression. And if the driver understands what those seven things are and can identify which of them that student is going through, they can take preventative steps and actually calm that person down by reassuring them in the right way. So training is going to be very important when we talk about that, you know, student on adult violence of the driver. And of course, you've got students that are active shooters in schools. You're going to have students who are active shooters on buses as well. But that response, again, is going to be very distinct and different because a, a shooter in a building versus a student student on a bus um, that is that is shooting. That's that's two different ball games there. Mm -hmm. Have you seen, you know, an increase in this kind of training for transportation departments? They kind of want this training and want to be educated. Yeah, we have, you know, like I said, we've been doing this for 17 years and initially um, nobody had even thought about doing this type of training. And so when we went in and worked with the school district, we went and worked with the bus company. It was all brand new and fresh. And now 17 years later, what we've seen is people have got a little flavoring of some training, maybe not the full training that, you know, maybe they need, but they've at least gotten an awareness. Something has somebody's talked to them along the way about it. So we are seeing progress there. It's I think a still a long way to go. Go, but we, we are getting better, I think, as a nation on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we just did a survey that we sent out to transportation directors asking if they've had the, that, you know, active shooter training. And I want to say more than half have. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, numbers are growing. Yeah. And inside the United States, you know, there's a lot of states that actually make it mandated statutorily that schools must do annual active shooter training. Uh, now, who puts that on, how it's put on, that varies state to state. Not every state mm -hmm. has that mandate. But with that, when a school is being told you have to do it, eventually it may take a year or two, people start realizing, oh, we need something for transportation as well. Mm -hmm. And so then they start getting involved. Okay. So as we wrap up the podcast here, Brett, I know you're going to be out in Reno. So can you give us a little, you know, tease on what that conversation is going to look like? Yeah. So going to be speaking on incident command and what does that look like for a school bus driver? What does it look like for a transportation department? Because when we start planning for incidents and emergencies, it's not just the active shooters and the violence that we've been talking about today, but you know, it's, it's the traffic crashes. It's what if the driver has a heart attack? What if you have a student that's allergic to bees and gets stung? It's that holistic view of emergency response and how do we command those incidents um, and try to keep everybody safe during the actual emergency. Mm -hmm. I'm going to throw another question at you before you go. Um, looking at incident command, every student has a cell phone. So is that something that needs to be taken in? Because I've been talking to transportation directors and they're saying, hey, these students are texting their parents that there's, you know, a crash, for example, before the bus driver is even radio dispatch. Yeah. And we're seeing that. And that's with students on a bus. It's students in a school. Um, it's students at the shopping mall. Right. And when something happens, everybody has that technology right there in their pocket. They pull it out and they can communicate with people. And so what we need to be careful of for incident command is making sure we don't overload the 911 system. If you think about a school bus crashes, something happens and every student calls 911, you're going to overload the system. And so having what we refer to as bus captain programs, where you take a more mature senior student student that rides the bus, give them the training they need. They can be a bus captain and help that driver be a little bit more responsible and reactive to emergencies that do occur. 
Okay. Well, I'm looking forward to your talk in Reno. It sounds like it's going to be a good one. Absolutely. <laughs> and then for our nation, we have a lot of articles on Brett's topics that he's discussed at either SDN Expo, Indy, or Reno. So you can go to stnonline.com. You can search Brett Brooks uh, right there in the search bar, and then all these articles will come up. I think we have articles on weapon identification, de-escalation techniques, school bus driver training. So definitely a list there. Check it out. Better yet, also, you guys come to Indy or come to Reno, hear Brett's conversation in person, ask him questions. Would love to see you guys. But thanks again, Brett, for jumping on the podcast. And uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you very much. A special thanks to the dynamic Taylor Ekpatani. Thanks for being on here, chatting with me about all the great headlines, filling in for Mr. Ryan Gray this week. Uh, also, thanks to John Ferguson at Klein ISD down in Texas and Brett Brooks, security expert at Gray Ram Tactical, for joining us on this episode and sharing your insights and thoughts. Always great to hear some perspective out in the industry. We appreciate our sponsors, Transfinder, IC Bus and Student Transportation of America. Guys, visit stnonline.com for all the latest news and analysis on the school transportation industry. Don't forget to sign up this summer for STN Expo. We got Indianapolis May 31st through June 4th. We also have STN Expo in Reno. That's July 12th through the 17th. Go to stnexpo.com, click on the show that you are most interested in and sign up today. Also save on the early bird registration. $100 $100 off your registration if you book soon. Make sure, do not wait. It will sell out. So go get in there, grab your seat. Guys, you can subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to Pods Nation. We love you. We'll see you next week. 